you're gonna see me rock the same like look for the two videos in July because I have to film this all in one weekend. Not too much. Not too be be nice to me. Not too much. This this looks cute. Be nice. Put yourself in 1911 Paris. This is pre World War II. We are in the center of European art and commerce. We have bustle skirts, we have the Gibson girls, uh, we have not entered the depression yet. And one of the public's worst fears has come to materialize. No, it is not the untimely expiration of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. It's the public's, like, third worst fear. For years, the Louvre has had a problem with its lackluster security, and the newspapers have been reporting. Numerous art thefts regularly take place at the Louvre at this point, and papers are going so far as to say that at this rate, we might even lose the Mona Lisa. And oh, how right they were. In his Parisian abode, Pablo Picasso is very likely sweating. Yeah, that Picasso. Because he's about to be tied into this. Pablo Picasso, likely sweating. Very likely sweating. At this time, 1911 Paris, Picasso is a much younger man. He is in his late-ish 20s, and his name... <laughs> it's not in the papers, but it might as well be. Please don't judge my horrible pronunciation of things in French. I don't speak French, so hablo en español. I'm doing my best. I am so sorry. Actually, correct my pronunciation. Leave uh, how to enunciate things in the comments. Like, that would be really nice of you. Cool. Picasso's friends with Apollinaire. Apollinaire happens to have a secretary. His name is Honoré Joseph Piret. Honoré Joseph Piret is shady. The man is shady. To be fair, everybody in the story is shady, but Piret especially. In, in this like opening scenario, very shady. Pire saw the stealing of the Mona Lisa as his opportunity to brag because he is one of the many thieves that likes to snatch things up at the Louvre. A thief brings us a work stolen from the Louvre is plastered on that morning's newspaper, the one where Picasso is likely in a cold sweat. And on this thing is not the Mona Lisa, which is what everybody is looking for. It is an Iberian bust. These things right here, limestone busts, some of the earliest work captured from the Iberian Peninsula. And Picasso was obsessed with them. As you may or may not know, Picasso, proud Spaniard. The man, the man's all about España, like he's one of those. And as far as he was concerned, those Iberian busts were the purest form of Spanish art, and he wanted to capture that in his own work. So what does he do? Apparently, he asked his friend's secretary to steal from the Louvre for him because Pinet would go on in the article to claim that he regularly stole from the museum. For this in particular, he claimed to have stolen on multiple back-to-back -back days three Iberian busts, two of which were sold to unnamed friends in Paris, one of whom was a painter. You, you might, he might as well have just said Picasso. Like it really wasn't that hard to realize who he was talking about at the time. Two years before the newspaper came out, he had done his first great, like famous artwork. You've probably heard of it. It's called Les Demoiselles de Avignon. This proto-cubist piece would be a watershed moment for the art world. The lack of depth in the piece, the lack of definition in the actual body, the mass themselves making up the face, the sharpness of the geometric lines, how the style changes throughout the painting. This piece was also inspired by a hodgepodge of different works. The Iberian bust, as mentioned, African tribal masks, uh, ladies of the night that Picasso had befriended to be his model. This painting did not only lead to the Cubist movement, all right? No, 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 no. This painting is credited for being the very first piece of real modern art. She's famous, nom, 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 delicious. But right now in the story, we are in Paris in 1911 and the public is pissed. As you can imagine, having the Mona Lisa stolen from the Louvre was a shock to Parisian psyche. Even if things have been stolen from the Louvre in the past, like it's it's the Mona Lisa, it's, a, it's the Mona Lisa. And now this random man 
who, by the way, is Polish, is like up in here being like, oh yeah, I steal from your museums all the freaking time and I sell it to my other friends. The event was absolutely a tipping point and it involves three separate foreigners. Triggered a lot of xenophobia. Apollinaire and Picasso basically meet up, uh, and like the likely scenario, likely scenario is that Picasso strong-armed Apollinaire into giving the busts to the newspapers because Apollinaire was a writer. Uh, so he thought, they, they must have thought, likely, that if Apollinaire gave the busts to the newspapers with them being cool and them being writers and all, that the newspapers might have a level of discretion and not tell the police. That did not happen. That did not happen. Piret, as mentioned earlier in the story, was from Belgium and he had already hightailed it back home, left Paris, went home. Apollinaire and Picasso uh, were like, they, they were faced with the very real uh, chance of being deported out of France entirely back to their hometowns, Nate, like, <sighs> So this was a serious thing for them, like beyond the fact that they were already like being interrogated for the Mona Lisa, like they, they were not having a good time. And very unfortunately, these two dudes were the only leads to the Mona Lisa. <laughs> like they were, the police had been scouring Paris, they questioned everybody that worked that night at the Louvre, they questioned people that no longer worked there, like previous employees. The, the police were, um, they were coming up short. They had nothing to go off of for the Mona Lisa case. So these, these two fools, who were also foreigners and not well liked, because Picasso was an asshole. The Modern Lovers was wrong. Picasso was an asshole. If somebody was gonna take the fall for this, these two fools were gonna be real, they were gonna be a real good hit. Old boys are taken into interrogation and it is immediately obvious that these two stooges know absolutely nothing about the Mona Lisa. Apollinaire is scared and Picasso is so scared that he pretends that he doesn't even know who Apollinaire is. Like legit, try to imagine them in like different rooms and like a billionaire's like, I don't know, like I, I, I've never, I, I didn't know the, like, we only got the bus, so I don't know anything about the Mona Lisa. Meanwhile, Picasso's like, I don't even know him! A billionaire, who? Who? Like, man's a coward. So Dumb and Dumber were released because it's pretty obvious that they knew nothing about the Mona Lisa, <sighs> but... The damage had already been done to their reputation. Uh, and for every single day that the Mona Lisa would be missing, these fools would have their lives made uncomfortable. And she would be gone for another two years. <laughs> two whole years. And the Mona Lisa has not left Paris. I'm serious. She did not leave Paris. She's been in Paris the entire time. Miss Lady is stashed out in a rinky-dink apartment just a couple of blocks away from the Louvre in a trunk with a false bottom. I don't know if y'all know this, but the Louvre is the biggest museum in the world. So before the Louvre with the Louvre, that building was a royal Parisian abode, like it was the king's summer house, and then, you know, choppy choppy, so what were we gonna do with the building? Mr. Napoleon Bonaparte said, let her be a museum in 1793-ish. Now, despite being the largest museum in the world, at the time, the Louvre only had about, like, 200 security guards. And alarms were a thing at the time, but they were not largely used until after the First World War. This is 1911. She has not happened yet. This made it very easy for Pirette and also former Louvre employee Vincencio Peruga to steal whatever they wanted. No. Yeah. The Mona Lisa was stolen by a former employee. At the time, the Mona Lisa was held in the Salon Carri. I don't know where she's held now, but like... Peruga decides to stash himself out in a, like, supply closet in Salon Carri. And just, just wait. Just wait until the museum closed. Legit. He, he pulled the shit like Audrey Hepburn in How to Steal a Million Dollars. He just, he just like, easier than that, actually. He just sat there, no, no cool security, nothing. He just, 
He did what he did. He walked out of that closet after hours with a little white apron around him, which was at the time the uniform for everybody that worked at the Louvre. Walked his way up to the Obra. Yoink. Took it off the wall. Took off the protective glass, which he helped make, by the way, because he was a Louvre handyman. So like he made that shit. He knows he knows how to take it off. And it removes her from her wooden canvas, wraps her up, and puts a white cloth over her. Sneaks her underneath his little apron and starts walking down a set of stairs. Like a set of employee stairs. He starts walking down a set of stairs to the exit. That easy. The only snag in this entire plan was when he got up to the door and realized that the door was locked. So he like comes up with the idea of like taking the lock off the door. And the janitor walks by as soon as he's about to start to take the lock off the door or is like really early into that process. <laughs> and the, the, the janitor is like, Oh, hello, fellow museum employee. Are are you stuck in here after hours? Do you need me to open the door for you? Legit, like, that easy. Peruga's like, yeah, actually, I would like you to open the door for me. Thanks, bestie. And he snooks away with the Mona Lisa, still tucked beneath his apron with that white cloth on it. Like, easy peasy, walks off. And she would not be seen again for two years. It actually took everybody a couple of days to realize that she was missing. Because at the time, employees would regularly take paintings off to go, like, restore and do their dusting and all that good jazz. So when she was missing, like, that blank space on the wall, people legitimately just assumed that the Mona Lisa was in for, like, handling. Because they're, like, documentation. We don't know her, apparently. It wasn't until somebody came in and asked uh, a guide where he could find the Mona Lisa that they were, like... I'd like to know that too. Finally, two years later, when Peruga thought that the hype, the anger, the vitriol had died down, he goes ahead and calls a Florentine art dealer named um, Alfonso, Alfonso Getty? Alfredo. Alfredo Getty. He goes ahead and calls a guy named Alfredo Getty. He is a Florentine art dealer saying, like little clip phone, he's like, hey, Hey, Mr. Sir, I have the original Mona Lisa. I would like to sell her to you. And Getty was like, oh no shit. Okay, come down to Florence. We will see for ourselves. And then calls the police. <laughs> and the police is like, can you verify that it's the Mona Lisa? And he goes, I'm gonna call a friend of mine. So he calls up his friend who is the director of the Uffizi Gallery, Giovanni Poggi. Giovanni Poggi, right? If you're Italian, correct me. He calls up Giovanni Poggi. They both go to Peruga's hotel room and they take a look at the painting that Mr. Peruga has like graciously rolled out for them. And they're like, oh my God, that's actually the Mona Lisa. And Peruga is like, yes, pay me like a billion dollars. And then Getty and Poggi are like, psych we called the police and then the police come out of the back and they're just like you're under arrest sir and that's how they retrieve the Mona Lisa when asked about his motivations uh Peruga would go on to say that passing by the Mona Lisa every day he came to fall in love with her smile and that he would periodically like open the false backing in his trunk so that he could look at her after work yeah, uh, he said that he stole her in order to return her to Italy. Like that was his defense, which at the time was seen as pretty good defense in, in Paris. Like, yeah, Parisians were largely xenophobic at the time, but they also respected the national pride to go so far as to steal the Mona Lisa to like return her to Florence. Um... So he got off on a lighter sentence. The Mona Lisa had a fun little tour around Florence before she was returned to the Louvre, which was her rightful home because she was in fact sold by da Vinci to one of the kings of France, whose name I do not remember. In history is what would elevate the Mona Lisa 
from a beautiful and respected masterpiece to a cultural icon referenced in just about any pop culture and modern art. And if I had a nickel for every time I've heard a story about art stolen from the Louvre that comes to shape modern art as we know it, I would have two nickels. Which is not a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. And so close together, and that they're tied together. <laughs> Alrighty, so that's all I got for you today. Once again, my name is Nick. I'm a graphic designer and this here is my chill zone. I research art history, I dive into art analysis, and I make my own DIY projects based off of my research. If any of that sounds good to you, please feel free to give this channel a follow. Or don't. I'm not the boss of you. If you got even an iota of new information or a modicum of joy out of this, please feel free to give this a like. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next one. Goodbye!